Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. So, uh, you guys know what a waifu is? I was lucky enough not to know until the internet swallowed me whole and spit me out as a cartoon dragon that reads Reddit, proving to me that there are truly fates worse than death. For the uninitiated, a waifu is basically what happens when you combine the male loneliness epidemic with the societal cancer that is weeaboo culture. Imagine slapping a metaphorical wedding ring on the finger of a woman who doesn't even know you exist. Not because you're a hopeless loser, but because she's a fictional character who is literally incapable of comprehending existence because she's literally just a bunch of lines who looks like a girl drawn by some Japanese dude. Yeah, yeah, for some people, waifu is laifu, and the allure of a two-dimensional woman is much more appealing than a partner who possesses unnecessary characteristics. You know, like being real and not a disappointment to your parents. But you see, dear listener, much like the apple in the Garden of Eden, the forbidden fruit of the fictional woman extracts its toll. For there is such thing as too much waifu. The story I have for you today stars a player whose DM is amazing except for one teeny tiny little quirk with his NPCs that will become pretty apparent soon enough. Now without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes from Reddit user Lycanroc the Alt Owo and is titled DM Makes Too Many Waifu NPCs. I'd like to start this with the fact that this is relatively lighthearted. Nothing too terrible, and aside from getting too far attached to these NPCs they make and putting their weird fantasies on them, this person is an incredible DM. Like, seriously. Interesting plots, weaving in backstories, and engaging world building. The only flaw this person has is that they try so hard to force waifu NPCs onto the party, or try to get these NPCs to weasel their way out of the consequences that they get themselves into. Now, I would like to add that I do not use the term waifu as an insult to anime culture. I myself enjoy anime, and the DM themselves actually use the term waifu when describing these types of NPCs. Tentatively tagged NSFW at the fact that there are a lot of women involved doing questionable things, but I don't go into it too much, i.e. prostitution, succubi, mentions of large chests, trying to coax players into sleeping with said characters, etc, etc. Our group is more RP heavy than combat heavy, but that isn't to say the four of us players don't enjoy combat, though the DM seems to think that this means that we are going to avoid it at all costs, or use the power a friendship to turn our enemies into friends or something. That out of the way, here are a few notable instances of the DM's waifu NPCs. 1. In a D&D game, an elven girl stalks us to a tribal village, attempting to assassinate our bard player's NPC husband after he won a non-lethal duel against an arrogant noble. The elven girl is described as being relatively young, although not in an overly sexual manner appearing to be a young adult, and was probably intended to be sympathized with. We win the fight, but just barely, as she has some nasty poison. Since our bard was chaotic good aligned, we captured her and allowed the chieftain of the tribal village, the party's fighter, to deal with her. He was lawful neutral aligned, and while he didn't want to kill the elven girl outright, he opted to after realizing that she could return to the village with more of the lethal poison if she wanted to seek revenge. The DM then makes the chieftain fighter roll an unreasonably high roll for an elven girl at 4 HP, I kid you not, trying to crawl away from him. Since the fighter had enough strength, he succeeded and apologized before giving her a quick death by cutting her head off. The DM was visibly upset for the rest of the session, although he insisted that he did not care. The fighter asked why he put the elven girl in there if the DM didn't want her to die and the DM only replied with the fact that they thought that we would want to help a lost soul. While the party was mostly good aligned, I cannot fathom why the DM thought that we would befriend someone trying to kill the bard's husband. Best case scenario, we would throw the elf back to the streets or lock her up for a bit. Okay, let's take a look at waifu number one, shall we? An elven assassin that secretly has a heart of gold who's now got the head of a Lego person. 
removable, that is. So this is actually something that I see a lot of DMs, including myself, doing. You know, you make an antagonist NPC that you think is just so cool, and you get a little bummed out that they might get murked by a band of plucky adventurers. So then you start thinking, oh, maybe with the power of friendship, the party will realize that they're just misguided and have a traumatic past. If Uncle Iroh could redeem Zuko, then maybe my party's cleric could find a way. Oh, they killed him. Look. If some ne'er-do-well breaks into my home at 3 a.m. with a deadly weapon and tries to cause bodily harm to someone I give a shit about, I'm not gonna walk up and try to give them the hug that their dad never gave them. No, I'm doing as the Founding Fathers intended, grabbing my rifle and dialing 556 30 times, and maybe I'll wonder what their deal is when I'm watching the forensics guy scrape what's left of the bastard off my wall. Players are already bloodthirsty on their own. But making an NPC a threat to a player's character or a different NPC that the party's adopted? Buddy, you just signed their death warrant. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I guarantee you that nothing short of the death of that PC is gonna prevent the gratuitously violent demise of that yet-to-be-redeemed villain. And even then, that player's next character is probably gonna have some weird grudges that they can't quite explain. Now, if you're trying to pull a Zuko, as I like to call it, your chances of success are never guaranteed and you're gonna have to go with whatever your party wants. But to increase the chances of their redemption arc not ending at the end of a blade, try and have your villain be a threat to the party's wealth or less valued items instead of anything that the players actually care about. And it never hurts to assume that cold-blooded murder is gonna be their plan A. Two. In the same D&D campaign, we met a slime girl maid who works at a palace as the party has to work at the royal capital to get close to the king. She is instantly described as being beautiful, and the DM jumps to describing this beauty by her large chest. Our group doesn't mind more mature themes, but it seems so strange that he'd be describing her chest first. He'd do this any time the maid switched her outfit, describing briefly how the outfit would bring out her form or how they appeared to be bigger. I asked the DM to stop, but they did not, saying that he was just tastefully describing the maid, until one of the female players brought up that this made her feel uncomfortable. Finally, the DM bit their tongue and apologized. To their credit, the DM did not do this again. Three. A final mention of another incident from this campaign. A succubus attempts to seduce the chieftain fighter's NPC brother, and succeeds. The party's cleric notices, and knowing the fighter's brother is married and with a child, assumes it is a demon or fae of some sort, and opts to trap it in a magic circle. The poor fighter is rightfully annoyed that he seems to be getting targeted. He assumes it's because he killed the elf girl two sessions prior. And with the help of the cleric, the two of them go to kill the succubus. The succubus pleads for her life, insisting that she would do anything to survive, as she looks the fighter in the eyes. Needless to say, neither of them take the uncomfortable bait, and a high-level cleric with Toll the Dead makes for a pretty strong cantrip. Four. In a Star Wars campaign, I had been playing a hitman trying to make a living on a new planet to provide for his family, not knowing any other way to make a living besides killing. I knew this would come to bite him and thought it would make for an interesting plot point. He was relatively good at his job, but refrained from interacting with his neighbors when unneeded. The party had relatively good chemistry and we all lived in the same apartment building. We were on the lower levels of Coruscant, but we had a few NPC neighbors as well. One of them was a Twi'lek engineer, who also turned out to be a stripper during the night. My character didn't really care, and while one of the other PCs, who was a scientist, had a passing conversation with her on engineering, no one really went out of their way to befriend her. I later got a hit to kill the Twi'lek's father, which I did, and with relatively good roles to show for it as well. However, the police got heavily involved in this realtor's death, despite the fact that there was more pressing matters at the time. 
a lieutenant police chief who had also died, which occurred after a different PC got drunk, and opted instead to investigate the death of this Twi'lek woman's father. What bothered me was that the DM had two different players arrested under very vague evidence despite the fact that I had tried to frame the Twi'lek, who I overheard saying she hated her dad. My hitman admits to doing it, and this automatically links to his four other killings somehow, as he wants to save his friends from dying in his place. Then, the Twi'lek, who I tried to frame and whose father I killed, then insists that she wants to help my character despite the fact that they interacted only briefly once before, and he just admitted to killing her father. He asked why, and her rationale was something along the lines of, well, I'm mad that you killed my dad, but uh, the rest of the people you killed were kind of bad, so I decided to help you in your trial, lol. Needless to say, my character does not trust her not to backstab him, and the party breaks him out instead. We flee to Tatooine to hide out for a bit, and the DM tries to get us to bring the Twi'lek. No one takes the bait. The party asks why we hate her and all of us admit that we don't. It's just that no one knows her that well, and I add that my hitman doesn't want to trust someone who has motive against him. This again upsets the DM, who insists that they had a whole arc for the NPC. I told them that I was sorry, but that they shouldn't have assumed that the NPC would just click with the party after only two brief conversations outside of the prison incident. Okay, there's waifu number two, three, and four. You guys shouldn't need me to explain what's wrong with the description of the slime girl's chest. What's with these guys in trying to Trojan horse their fetishes into D&D games? When I said the three pillars of D&D are combat, exploration, and roleplay, I didn't know I had to explain that it's not that kind of exploration and roleplay. It's gotten to the point where the correlation between monster girls and sex pest shenanigans can no longer be denied. But Drake! Where would I find slim, thick, short stack women if it wasn't for the goblin girls? They're called Latinas, bro! Turn off your computer and go outside! But I digress. What I can talk about is the fact that this DM has a flaw of writing out arcs for characters that haven't been introduced into the story yet. We also saw this when the DM introduced the elven assassin before she ran away to a waifu farm in the country. You see, when creating conventional narratives, it's a good thing to have a character arc planned for the rest of the story. With very little exception, interesting characters will exhibit change over the course of a story. And planning out what form that change is gonna take is a good idea most of the time. Keyword, most of the time. You see, writing characters to be NPCs is not like writing a conventional narrative. The story that these characters are a part of hasn't happened yet, and it almost is entirely determined by factors outside of your control <coughs> of the players. Imagine having a kid and then standing over their cradle while furiously typing out exactly how they're gonna overcome their flaws and what trials and tribulations they're gonna go through on Wattpad. That would be f ridiculous. When I create NPCs, I'll mostly write down a physical description, some stats in case the party wants to steal their lunch money, some key personality traits, and a goal. What does this NPC want? How would they go about getting it? Are they benevolent towards the party, or are they secretly a threat? Every single NPC gets this little blurb, and only when the party decides, yup, we care about this specific one, is when I put on my writer's cap and start making them into a deeper character. And even then, the growth that happens is a direct response to the actions of the party. The magic of an RPG comes from the fact that it's mostly organic. There's not supposed to be a way to predict how your player's journey is gonna go, but what is predictable is that 9 times out of 10, they're gonna want to have their game remain waifu-less. 5. Back to D&D, but in a different campaign, where we are now playing as PCs in a faction war, and had gone to a masquerade party to track our target. A half-skunk, half-human noble girl gets between us and the noble she's talking to an evil nobleman that we are trying to kill, as he works for the overlord of the enemy faction. To prevent her from joining the fight, the wizard thinks quickly and casts Gias on the skunk human girl, informing her that she cannot join the fight or spray if she was capable of it, unless she wished to harm herself by going against the command. 
fight. The DM's expression quickly fell, and he half-heartedly finished out the fight. When the paladin asked why the DM seemed so disappointed, the DM admitted that they were just frustrated and wanted the skunk human girl to spray someone because it would be funny, but admitted that they had no antidote intended if one of us had gotten sprayed either. We don't hurt the girl, but we make her vow not to tell anyone. When the noble girl stubbornly insists that she will tell, the barbarian then chucks her into the wine cellar and boards up the door. And we just leave. This only tilts the DM more, as they are very insistent on throwing more encounters at us on the way back. While I was annoyed at this, I did understand that it was kind of the barbarian's fault for poking the bear. 6. This is the final story. In a silly little one-shot, we had been playing as a group of monsters once, and I decided to be a copper dragon now stuck in his human form after playing a prank on a grumpy wizard. He had hoped, but had almost given up on ever turning back, and instead wanted to help the other players, which included a goblin who wanted to bring a stolen relic back to his tribe, a shiny metal saucer, a kobold artificer who wanted to take down a creature three times his size, and a harpy who had lost her singing voice. Our fifth player couldn't make it. The DM seemed to cling to the fact that my character was a dragon, though, because Ha ha, seduce the dragon funny. Deciding to send practically any woman in a 300 foot radius to flirt or hit on him. My dragon barbarian declined politely, lying that he had a wife and children to stop this. This worked on most NPCs, except a female Neko, half cat, half person for those who don't know, wizard, who was insistent on being with him, even after being told the lie. This Neko was annoying because she spoke in the... Oh god, we're still making me read this shit in 2024, huh? Me wanna be with you, please. You is a cutie pie. Ooh, ooh. Oh, fuck! You made me throw up my hot pocket! My copper dragon finally snapped, telling her off and lying about the whole wife and kids thing yet again. But this Neko rolled high enough to know that he was lying and told him that she would cast Witch. Apparently, she was high enough level to do that, to remove his curse on being stuck in his human form if he slept with her. My character declined and curtly bid her farewell, ignoring this NPC both in and out of character. I refused to interact with this weird cat for the rest of the session until the DM got bored of trying. Thankfully, the other three did get their wishes to come true. When the DM ended the one-shot without my character getting a proper chance at restoring himself, I politely excused myself and vented about this to my girlfriend at home. She mostly just laughed at the story, saying that it reminded her of her little brother, but then sympathized and comforted me. All in all, strange and somewhat annoying to deal with but not totally unbearable. I've had many great sessions with this DM when they do not include their waifu fantasies. And honestly, everyone else in the group is incredible. Sorry if that story was rambly, I just wanted to get it off my chest. I can't keep weighing and bogging down my girlfriend with all of these stories. End of story. Hey, saddle me with a waifu once, shame on you. Saddle me with a waifu six, times, shame on you, times 30. While this story certainly wasn't as bad as some other horror stories we've covered, it certainly wasn't good. What I see here is the DM pulling a Dan Schneider trying to skirt the line and see how much he can get away with before people start to notice how much of a creep he is, and becoming spiteful when people point out how much of a creep he is. Look, I understand that D&D &D is gonna be different for different people and every group is gonna have different tolerances for different stuff, but for f**k's sake, you literally got a DM who created a skunk girl for the explicit purpose of farting on you, what the f is that about? If it were me, I personally would have dipped around waifu number three. It's obvious to me that this DM either doesn't understand or is actively ignoring the fact that his players don't vibe with the overabundance of waifu shenanigans. I don't care who you are, once you've been told no, that's it. 
you've been told no. I don't care what the character arc of the slime chick is supposed to be. Stop describing our slime bags, please. But you know what I never want to stop? Cool people sending me fan art. That's right, let's take a look at this week's gallery of the drink. This week's fan art comes from Reddit user bloodcakes for bunny pyre who depicts a glorious Drake standing amongst his treasured horde of cringe. While it is true that all artistic interpretations of my divine being are things of beauty, this one seems extra radiant. Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while- Oh my god, Drake! You're glowing! Aw, thanks, little buddy. That would be my new skincare routine. No, like, you're literally glowing! Oh, yeah, I started taking those gamma supplements all the other YouTubers are getting sponsored by. It's really- Uh, Drake, those are gamer supplements! Gamma is a type of high-frequency radiation! Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, fuck. Thank you again, Bloodcakes for Bunny Pyre, for submitting your art. If you'd like to see your fan art featured in Gallery of the Drake, go ahead and send it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of doing YouTube, and it means the world to me that I can inspire artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and send in your fan art. And if you feel like supporting the channel further, my Patreon and merchandise links are in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake.